Hi there. I'm Scott with B&H, and after doing videos on several admittedly pretty cool laptops, a workstation desktop finally landed on, well, under my desk. I recently got to spend time with one of HP's Z6 G5A tower workstations, and it is easily the most powerful computer that I've ever used. Built around the AMD Threadripper Pro 7000 line of CPUs, this station can accommodate an insane number of components, leading to some pretty wild specs. So let's dive in and take a look at some of the possibilities. Now, to put it mildly, Threadripper CPUs are known for having quite a few threads. It's really refreshing when equipment is given such a straightforward naming convention. And while ARM-based CPUs have been making big waves in the market, the Threadripper line proves that x86 still has a place, especially when it comes to pure power. The top of the Threadripper Pro 7000 line is the 7995WX, which has 96 cores, 192 threads, a base frequency of 2.5 GHz, a max boost frequency of 5.1 GHz, 480 MB of cache total, over 78 billion 5 nanometer transistor nodes, and 148 PCIe lanes. It's important to note, however, that the Threadrippers are not just about raw power but also the ability to spread out that power to accommodate a plethora of components at once, hence all those PCIe lanes. Fortunately, this tower makes it really easy to saturate those lanes with whatever configuration of components a given workflow needs. There are six PCIe slots, four of those are 16-lane PCIe Gen 5 slots, one is a 16-lane PCIe Gen 4 slot, and the last one is a four-lane PCIe Gen 4 slot. There are four M.2 slots, two of which are four-lane PCIe Gen 5 slots, with the other two being four-lane PCIe Gen 4 slots. Finally, there are two eight-lane SlimSAS PCIe Gen 4 connectors for NVMe storage, as well as two SATA ports. Of course, even the niftiest of CPUs aren't really much use if the work is bottlenecked by RAM. So, to back up the Threadripper, the HP Z6 G5A has eight DDR5 5600 DIMM memory slots and can support up to one terabyte of RAM total. And another touch that was really nice is that the internal layout is clean and easy to navigate. I didn't even have to pull out a toolbox. Everything just snaps into place. That is potentially super useful for repairs, upgrades, or even just reconfigurations to adjust to new workflow needs. And there truly is a lot of flexibility when it comes to those configurations. For instance, if storage space is a primary concern, the HP Z6 G5A gives plenty of avenues to allow the Threadripper to use as bounty of resources to accommodate that. To max out internal storage, one would need eight 4TB SSDs and two 12TB hard drives. On top of that, there's also the optional HP QX448 PCIe removable carrier. Now, our model didn't come equipped with it, but it would fit below the front I.O. ports. This removable carrier can support up to four hot swappable two terabyte SSDs. Of course, it is improbable that anyone would prioritize local storage to such an extent, but to be fair, the Threadripper is built to make wild configurations possible, so who am I to judge? But a more likely use case is focusing on data intensive work. The high number of threads means that the Threadrippers are exceptional for CPU based data processing, but these days, a lot of computational work is designed to be handled by the GPU. Luckily, the Threadripper is still an amazing choice for those situations, thanks to all those PCIe lanes. The HP Z6 G5A has 17 GPU cards available, ranging from entry-level 4GB cards like the AMD Radeon X6400 and the NVIDIA RTX A400, to much heftier 48GB cards like the AMD Radeon Pro W7900 or the NVIDIA RTX 6000 ADA generation, or a specialized GPU like the 40GB NVIDIA A800 Active, which is dedicated to high-end data processing like you'd find in AI work. More impressively, these towers can fit up to three GPUs, meaning that, theoretically, it is possible to use three NVIDIA 6000 ADA generation GPUs for a total of 144 gigabytes of VRAM. Sadly, that remained theoretical for me since our review model only had one impressive GPU installed. But while our review model wasn't fully spec'd out, it was still easily the most powerful workstation that I've ever used. Ours used the Threadripper Pro 7975WX, which has 32 cores and 64 threads, compared to the 7995WX, which has 96 cores and 192 threads. Still, the 7975WX is obviously going to be very good at any task that I, a YouTube video content producer, am at all capable of throwing at it. 
The real question then is how well normal parts of my workflow make use of all those impressive specs. So I loaded up the test projects that I've used in past videos, found a few additional benchmark tests to throw into, and then opened up Performance Monitor in a fresh spreadsheet. Of course, export times won't really tell us much, but I'll still throw up some charts while I go over my casual methodology. My usual bevy of tests involve exporting sequences with media of various codecs from DaVinci Resolve and Adobe Premiere slash Media Encoder. I run After Effects renders involving several effects, most notably 3D layers and particle effects, and then wrap things up with a handbrake CPU only encode. This time around, I also used Topaz AI to upres a 4K clip to 8K and ran the Topaz benchmark test as well as the Cinebench 2024 and Blender benchmark tests. The additional benchmarking was added because I knew that I would need to throw in some CPU based computational processes involving things like AI and 3D rendering to make the most of this CPU. Turns out, that was a good call. Resolve Premiere and Topaz consistently made good use of the CPU threads 0, 1, 8, and 9, and the other threads in the 0 to 15 range had varying degrees of utilization. Premiere slash Media Encoder and Topaz largely ignored threads 16 through 63, but Resolve was able to occasionally put a little bit of processor load on threads 48 through 63, and utilized all threads when processing red footage. At first, After Effects looked like it'd be a similar story. But once it started rendering 3D effects, motion blur expressions, and particle effects, it made great use of all 64 cores. A little while back, Adobe made a push to make After Effects encoding more efficient with better multi-frame rendering processes, and it looks like it paid off. Next up, Handbrake, which actually surprised me a little bit. It's usually very good at using every CPU resource at its disposal, but that wasn't really the case here. While it still made better use of resources than the NLEs and Topaz, it was far from maxing out the CPU. Curious, I looked into their official documentation and it turns out that their team knows the software has significantly diminishing returns after a certain number of cores, and in said documentation, I didn't see any example of data from CPUs with more than 22 cores. Finally, both Cinebench and Blender made full use of the CPU, which is good, but unsurprising considering 3D rendering is a very CPU-intensive process. In the end, these tests largely confirm my expectations. The sort of work I do could never properly put a workstation like this through its paces. While NLEs like Premiere and Resolve have been making strides to improve multi-thread performance, they do not have 64-thread CPUs in mind, let alone ones with 192 threads. After Effects was a whole other story showing performance gains that far outstrip the NLE results, and it really made me wish that we had some wildly complex After Effects projects on hand or that I was cool enough to dabble in 3D animation or any flavor of data science. But if you're like me and spend your days doing cut and dry NLE-based video editing, this probably isn't the computer for you. But if you are doing big 3D animation projects or crazy VFX work, I think you might be in for a treat. So how about it? Do you work on projects that would put this to good use? If so, I'd love to hear some feedback from anyone who specializes in those niches. And maybe you are someone who works in comp sci or a STEM field and somehow wound up on a channel tailored to photo, video, and audio work. And if so, what are your thoughts? I'm Scott with B&H. Keep it fun out there, y'all.